Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, my name is Ahmed Darwish, associate with Professor of Pediatrics, uh, Hematology Oncology, Bumar Transplantation Unit in Mansoura University. Today we are going to discuss uh, the approach for a cervical lymphadenopathy. First of all, we have to know that the lymphoid organs or and lymphoid tissues are widespread all over the body, constituting the immune system, including three main uh, categories, which are the primary lymphoid organs, including the thymus and the bone marrow. The bone marrow where the B lymphocytes are produced and the thymus where the T lymphocytes are produced. And the secondary lymphoid organs, including the spleen, the lymph nodes, Peyer's patches, and so on. And the tertiary lymphoid tissues where our other lymphoid tissues are present all over the whole body, especially in the skin and the respiratory system, even the reproductive or the genital system. If we can just see the structure of a lymph node, including the both blood supply vessels, the artery and veins, and we have the atherin and the etherin, the incoming lymph vessels, and the outgoing lymph vessels, you will know that the lymph node is responsible for filtration of the venous blood. If we can just see the uh, structure of a lymph node from inside, we can see that we have a fibrous capsule of the lymph node, and we have an afferent lymphatic, and there is an efferent lymphatic after filtration of the blood, and we have the cortex, and we have as well the medullary cords, and we have also the secondary follicles, including the mantle and the germinal center. So we have the primary follicle and we have the secondary follicle. As regards clinical examination, the most palpable lymph nodes present all over the body are the cervical, supraclavicular, axillary. We have the epitrochlear, inguinal, and the popliteal lymph nodes. For the cervical lymph nodes, we have two main groups, the transverse and longitudinal. The transverse group starts from the submental lymph node, then the submandibular, tonsillar or the jugulodigastric, the parotid, the preauricular, and the postauricular. And we have the occipital lymph node. For the longitudinal lymph nodes, we have the upper and lower. We have medial to the sternomastoid, we are the deep, and lateral to the sternomastoid, we are the superficial. We have also two of the most important groups of lymph nodes, the supraclavicular and posterior cervical, which have great significance mainly in malignancy. Okay, if you can just anatomically divide the cervical groups of lymph nodes into two main triangles, the anterior triangle, anterior to the sternomastoid, and the posterior triangle, posterior to the sternomastoid muscle. And here we have the drainage of all the cervical lymph nodes. We know that the submandibular lymph nodes are draining mainly the tongue and mouth and conjunctiva. The submental lymph nodes are draining the lower lip, the tip of the tongue, the cheeks, and the jugular digastric. They are draining mainly the tonsils and the parotid. The posterior cervical lymph nodes draining mainly the scalp and the skin and the skin of the arms and the thorax and the occipital from the scalp and head and postauricular from the external auditory meatus and the penna ear penna and the preauricular are draining mainly the eyelids and the penna as well however for the right supraclavicular it's draining mainly the mediastinum and the oesophagus and the lungs the left supraclavicular draining mainly the abdominal wall and thorax and sometimes the breast what about lymphadenopathy 40% it's estimated that about 40% of the no normal children have got palpable cervical lymph nodes. And these lymph nodes could be mistaken as sometimes something congenital, sometimes could parents could be anxious of the presence of malignancy, and it could be just a local presentation of a systemic disease. And these lymph nodes are usually found and discovered by the caregivers and the parents, of course, during the routine workup, like having a shower and so on. Uh, 
wearing their clothes. Okay, some definitions regarding lymphadenopathy. Usually, lymphadenopathy refers to uh, any lymph node, or refers to the nodes that are abnormal in size and consistency and all consistency. And we just say that lymphadenopathy is generalized if they are enlarged in two or more non contiguous areas. And the generalized lymph nodes are usually one quarter of patients with lymphadenopathy. However, localized, which is more, here, three quarters of the patients, it means that the lymph nodes are enlarged in one area. And this graph or diagram shows the generalized lymphadenopathy is 25%, localized is 75%, having 55% of them in the hidden neck, and 14 in the inguinal, and 5 in axillary, and only 1 in the supraclavicular lymph node. Lymphadenopathy, of course, is not uncommon. It's very common in the pediatric population, and the causes are countless, limitless. And lymph nodes, when they are expanding and becoming palpable and visible, this usually happens during an immune response to an infection. And when the acute response subsides, these lymph nodes will decrease, okay, in size, but it's not a matter that they will disappear. And we have to assure the parents that lymph nodes could still large However, the infection is off. In order to say that the lymph node is pathologic, it should be more than 2 cm. And we have to differentiate between acute, chronic, and subacute. Those acute lymphadenopathy are usually persisting less than 2 weeks duration. For subacute, they are uh, from 2 to 6 weeks. And for the chronic, these lymph nodes which are persistent for more than 6 weeks. What about causes of lymphadenopathy? The most common cause of lymphadenopathy in children is infection. And the most common infection is viral, especially Steinberg virus, infectious monoclosis and meme. But we have other infections like cytomegalovirus, rubella, hepatitis, HIV. We have also some bacterial infections like cat scratch fever, strept and staph, we mean the biogenic bacteria. And of course the mycobacteria as TB and fungal like histoplasmosis, some of chlamydias, toxoplasmosis and other parasites. It could be also a malignant disorder, like mainly leukemia and lymphoma, but it could be uh, other benign disorders of the immune system, like systemic lupus or juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It could be even just a reaction to a vaccine, to a drug. It could be uh, histocytosis. It could be some form of uh, lymphomycopatinous disease, like Kawasaki syndrome, and storage diseases as Gaucher and Limbic, or sarcoidosis, or others. Let's start with the infectious lymphadenopathy. Viral lymphadenitis is the most common, having Epstein-Barr virus, but others like Coxsackie, Rhino, Adeno, Cytomegalo, and so on. Usually lymph nodes, when they are due to viral infection, affecting the cervical lymph nodes, they are usually bilateral, diffuse, they are usually non-tender, and preceded by symptoms and signs of upper respiratory tract infection. But for bacterial infection and biogenic organism, and separative bacteria like Staph and Strep, usually we have high grade fever, we have an infection in the face mainly, like or whatever in the neck. It could be just a, have, having a, a history of sore throat, toothache, ear ache, upper respiratory tract infection, and it could be a skin infection as well. Usually the skin above the lymph nodes have got signs of inflammation, like cellulitis. Of course, if we have a redness above the lymph node, usually this signifies that the organism is a biogenic bacteria, and it needs an antibiotic, of course. For subacute lymphadenitis, which is two to six uh, weeks duration, uh, we see this when, whenever we have a lymph node, and it's treated with an antibiotic without response, it's usually occurring in TB, cat scratch fever, toxoplasma, a TB bacteria, and the atypical mycobacteria usually develops over weeks to months, and they are tender, they are rubbery, and have got what we call violaceous discoloration of the skin above the lymph node. And its diagnosis is mainly we take a material from the lymph node by fine needle aspiration, and we do what we call acid fast stain and culture. And this is the images showing the violaceous discoloration of the skin above the lymph nodes of atypical mycobacteria. What about toxoplasmosis, toxoplasma gondii, usually caused by consumption of undercooked meats, 
and ingestion of these oocytes from the cat feces, for example. Usually, in toxoplasmosis have got systemic manifestations, cervical lymph nodes. We diagnose it by uh, toxoplasma immunoglobulins. And usually, we have complications of toxoplasmosis, as pneumonitis, myocarditis. And we can treat toxoplasmosis by rabirimethamine and sulfonamides. What about infectious mononucleosis? As we have said, it's caused by many chamber virus. We have some sort of fever. And we have some sort of also of pharyngitis, exudate, but we have don't have redness. We have a painless lymph node, and it's usually not cervical only, but it's generalized together with hepatitis polynomegaly, it could occur. And uh, usually we have in the blood film lymphocytosis, which is mainly atypical lymphocytes in the blood film. And we can diagnose it by each number virus IgM and monospot test. And we have to know that tumcellular hypertrophy um, can be very large to cause some sort of airway obstruction. And sometimes we are in need for intervention and giving steroids sometimes. But don't forget that these exudate in the lymph node, we could be mistaken with strep. And some doctors can prescribe, will prescribe amoxicillin. But when those patients with Epstein-Barr virus are given amoxicillin, they will develop a characteristic rash in 80% of patients. And don't forget also that the spleen in those patients are, is soft and better to avoid any injury or, uh, or, or sport because it could lead to rupture of the spleen. So bed rest is important during the coming eight weeks from infection. And these photos can show the exudate on the pharynx and the atypical lymphocytes in the blood film. And this is a rash of uh, the skin that can occur after giving uh, amoxicillin in 80% of patients. What about chronic lymphadenitis? It means that lymph nodes are persistent more than six weeks, and we have incre risk of malignancy increased in leukemia, like leukemia, lymphoma, neuroplastoma, and others. And usually, when the lymph nodes are supraclavicular posterior triangle, the risk of malignancy is increased, and excisional biopsy should be done, and better to be referred to an oncologist to take decision. What about non infectious lymphadenopathy? One of the most important causes is Kawasaki disease. It's a lymphomucocutaneous disease. Well, we can diagnose Kawasaki by the presence of four of these five coming criteria, like fever more than five days, cervical lymphadenopathy, which is usually unilateral, and erythema and edema of the palms and salt with disclamation, non-purulent bilateral conjunctivitis, and stroke-free tongue. And of the complications of Kawasaki disease, it can lead to coronary artery aneurysm and myocardial infarction. And that's why we can do ECHO and ECG for those patients. For treatment, better to be given intravenous immunoglobulin and aspirin. And these figures show the stroperi tongue, the non purulent conjunctivitis, the peeling or desquamation of the palms and so. What about histocytosis? It's one of the malignancies that can lead to osteolytic lesions and, so, and that's why sometimes in lymphadenopathy, cervical or generalized uh, bone survey could be of value to see whether we have osteolytic lesions. Whenever we have osteolytic lesions, this can denote histocytosis. We have many types of histocytosis like eosinophilic granuloma, hand chiller Christian disease, litter Siwi disease, and of course histopathology showing lymph node architecture is increasing the Langerhans cell macrophages and eosinophils. Okay, reaching now to the approach of lymphadenopathy, cervical lymphadenopathy. As we mentioned, that history and examination are very important in the diagnosis. Sometimes we need minimal lab and radiology to reach the diagnosis. The most common cause is reactive lymphadenopathy to both viral and bacterial infection. What questions in the history we have to ask about? Of course, we have to ask the patients about history of fever. Malaise and rixia and myalgia, pain and tenderness in the node, any pain like sore throat, toothache, ear pain, pain, manifestations of upper respiratory tract, any exposure for an insect mite or animals, and traveling to any areas, especially those who have got in the city for tuberculosis, history of immunization, history of drug intake, for example, phenytoin, allopurinol, isoniazide, or even vaccines like MMR, PCG, DBT. Polyomyelitis, typhoid, and so on.
And uh, we have to elicit the timing of the appearance and the rate of progression of lymph node. It's common for lymph node to be reported as suddenly appearing. Of course, this is not so, uh, usually true because the parents' assumption that the nodes were not present until the moment, but of course, uh, it could be just unnoticed by them and it was present since weeks. Progression over months, of course, we have to know that it could be a Hodgkin disease. And the presence of perioritis, fever, night sweat, weight loss, it should be of significance, like presence of malignancy or TB, or sometimes collagen disease. What about examination? Of course, we have to examine the patient for the presence of any toxemia and fever, the presence of infection like entigocellulitis, otitis, pharyngitis, sinusitis, uh, tooth uh, cares, and sometimes we have to look also for the size of the lymph nodes, if it is unilateral or bilateral, tender or non-tender, sphexed or not, hard or soft, and we have to examine the lungs for the presence of pneumonia or cavitation, and we have to examine the abdomen for hepatosplenomegaly and to, for the presence of other lymph nodes like axillary or inguinal. Normally, palpable lymph nodes, small cervical and inguinal or axillary, especially in any, so it's not a must when the lymph nodes are palpable that they are pathologic because they are normally palpable. And the size of lymph nodes which could be of significance are the axillary lymph nodes, axillary and cervical if they are more than 1 or 2 cm, inguinal more than 1.5, epitrichter if 0.5, but any lymph nodes, whatever the size is, if it's more than 2 cm, it should be suspicious. What about tenderness? The presence or absence of tenderness does not reliably differentiate between benign and malignant because painful lymph nodes, it of course denotes infection, especially with erythema. But however, some malignant lymph nodes can show some pain because of hemorrhage into the lymph node causing stretching of the capsule leading to pain sometimes. What about consistency? If it is hard, of course, it could be cancer. If it's rubbery, it could be lymphoma. But if it is soft, it's usually infection or inflammation and the presence of abscesses if it's plucked. The presence of supraclav and epitrochlear lymph nodes usually denotes alarm for malignancy. And the presence of redness of the overlying skin and the presence of tenderness usually signify acute bacterial infection. And the presence of browny textured skin above the lymph nodes usually in the atypical mycobacteria. Of course, localized lymph nodes, cervical, usually it's either infection or Hodgkin, inguinal usually infection, mediastinal usually pathologic, of course, and for generalized, mostly to be pathologic rather than infection. Localized malignant causes include the Hodgkin disease, the neuroplastoma, histocytosis, rhabdomyosarcoma, and for generalized, it could be leukemia or non Hodgkin lymphoma. What about investigations? Of course, the most important investigations to be done are a CBC and blood film, showing the differential leukocyte count. ESR is mandatory because if it's more than 100, it be sometimes denoting uh, malignancy or TB or collagen disease. Sometimes we have to go for rapid antigen detection tests for some bacteria like strep. We have to collect 24-hour urine to, to see the some metabolites as vanillyl mendelic acid in the urine. LDH could be high. The serology of some viral and bacterial infection and parasites like Stamber virus, Bartonella, Psychomegalu, Toxoplasma, HIV, and so on. Tuber clean test is, is, is of significance. Just x ray to see whether we have mediastinal masses or we have uh, any lung infection. CT and MRI, ultrasound, and sometimes in Kawasaki we need to do ECG and ECHO. Of course, biopsy is mandatory and we will refer to this section later. What are the criteria in the in the, of, of, of lymphoma in, in the ultrasound because some parents are anxious that the cervical lymph node could be Hodgkin disease. If you look to the size of lymph nodes, lymph nodes in lymphoma tend to be larger in size than infection. A progressive nodal enlargement on serial follow-up is more, is more important. So we have to do serial ultrasound to see whether they are increasing in size or not. Number two, usually the lymph node normally it's, it's oval in shape, but it becomes rounded, it's usually of lymphomatous origin. And when the lymph nodes have got this well defined borders, uh, it's, it's more with malignancy. 
And especially if the hilum is hypoechoic, without echogenicity. And uh, of course, the presence of some pseudocysts could be present, especially in non Hodgkin lymphoma. What about intranodal necrosis and calcification as a feature of lymphoma? Of course, uh, uh, the patient receiving previous radiation and chemotherapy can have this calcification and necrosis, but uh, from the beginning in lymphoma, necrosis calcification could be present as well. What about the vascular distribution? Lymphomatists, lymphomatists lymph nodes, tends mainly to have to have hyalur and peripheral visits. So it's not only hyalur, but you have both hyalur and peripheral as already present on uh, the left side, where we have vascularity in the hilum and in the periphery. However, reactive lymph node has got echogenic hilum continuous with the adjacent structure. So on the, on the right side, this is a reactive lymph node having vascularity in the, the center, in the hilum. However, in uh, malignant on the left side, have got uh, vascularity in both uh, hilar and in the periphery as well. What about the diagnosis? Usually generalized lymph nodes have got a systemic disease. So we have to proceed for some investigations like CBC, blood film, bone marrow, monospot test, virology screen, and so on. But if the diagnosis cannot be made, clinicians sometimes go for biopsy, like excisional biopsy. But for localized lymph node, the decision to biopsy is more difficult because patients with a benign clinical history and remarkable any physical examination, no constitutional manifestation, we have to re-examine him back in three to four weeks for any regression or disappearance. But if it's unexplained with some constitutional manifestation, some risk factors for malignancy, and if it's persistent for more than one month, for example, we can do biopsy. And this algorithm is saying that when we go for history and physical examination, we just go for some diagnostic features like the presence of pharyngitis, conjunctivitis, and so on. So we can treat this condition. And if it's just suggestive, we do some specific testing for mononucleosis and viral infection. And if it's positive, we have to treat as well. But if it's negative or the history and the physical examination are unexplained, we have to go further to see whether this is a generalized or a localized lymph node. Because if it is a generalized lymph node, we have to review the epidemiology clues and review the medications given to this patient. If you do some CBC, uh, mononucleosis, serology, if positive, we have to treat. And if it's negative, we have to go further for doing chest X-ray. We have to go further for doing HIV screening. We have to do the um, hepatitis B, and if they are all negative, we can do biopsy. But for localized lymph node, we have to go back for the history and examination. And if we have no risk for malignancy or serious illness, we have to observe for extra one month. And if it's resolved, it's okay. But if it's not resolving, or if we have risk of malignancy and serious illness, we have to do biopsy. So, uh, what about biopsy? If you go for biopsy, what about biopsy? We have two main types of biopsy, which is the fine needle aspiration cytology. And we have the open biopsy, which means excisional biopsy. So for fine needle aspiration cytology, we can just have remove, we can just remove a sample of cells from the lymph node and it's taken over 10 to 15 minutes. But for open biopsy or uh, excisional biopsy, it, we have remove a portion or an entire lymph node, and it takes about 30 to 45 minutes. We have to know that the fine needle aspiration cytology is occasionally an alternative excisional biopsy because it's usually unhelpful. And the biopsy should be avoided in patients with probable viral illness. Why? Because Usually, lymph node pathology in these patients may sometimes simulate lymphoma and lead to a false positive diagnosis of malignancy. So, please don't do biopsy if you are expecting viral infection. Okay, let's go for some quizzes. We have to know that which is the mass which is moving with the tongue protrusion, and if the middle line goes for the differential diagnosis with the brachial lymph node, it's a thyroglossal duct system. Now, what is the mass which is in the midline and often has got calcifications on blend films? Is there moid cyst? Now, what is the mass which is a smooth and fluctuant along the sternomastoid muscle? 
it's a branchial cleft cyst and the mass which is enlarging with valsalva maneuver is laryngeal what about the mass which is present after birth growing rapidly plateau and it's red or bluish in color it's hemangioma the mass which is trans illuminating and is compressible it's cystic hygroma and the mass which is present with torticollis it's mainly sternomastoid tumor and a mass which is bilateral hard and immobile it's a cervical rib and lastly we have the mass which is palpated superior to the jawline it's mumps thank you